Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome on such a beautiful day. I'm, I'm down in the Abercrombie building, a bit chilly down here, but I've got a beautiful view out to the south over across to the airport. And so it's it's really lovely to be here and to welcome and thank you, you all for joining us as we as online today as we celebrate this wonderful Global Accessibility Awareness Day. And before we begin proceedings, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and culture. As I said, I'm in the Abercrombie building on campus today, on main campus, and I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay respect to their elders past, present and future. And please feel free to acknowledge country um, in the chat. Um, we're supporting uh, today by live captions and you can, they've been integrated into the meeting and you can use the live captions by turning on the CC, pressing the CC button in your menu bar, or you can go to the link in the chat uh, for a slightly different way of doing it. And so before we get going, I'd just like to thank the library who, as, as always, are, are leaders across the institution in, in digital accessibility. And I'd like to thank them for organizing the event and hosting it today as part of their, as part of their program. Um, so I'll just say a few words before we get going to the real, really important people. And that's 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 really to talk about why Global Accessibility Awareness Day is so important to us. Um, it's really to get everybody thinking, talking and learning and chatting about digital access and inclusion. And the more than more, 1 million people across the world that live with some kind of disability. So we want to focus on celebrating solutions, things that get us get things working for us, new technologies, perhaps real world applications of those technologies that help uh, students, staff and the, and the wider public um, access digital resources. Um, I think over the last couple of years, the importance of accessibility of digital resources, the importance of digital resources is, of course, blown out. Um, I remember a couple of years ago when we were trying to get more than before COVID when we were trying to get digital accessibility and digital resources up onto the up on the, the priority list. It was really a battle. People were very wedded to their to their books, to their textbooks, etc. And of course that had to change and it changed very quickly. And it changed very successfully across not just our institution but across many universities. And that was fantastic to see. Um, Digital resources and digital technology can, of course, make us feel more connected. And many of us relied on those kind of ways of connecting during the last few years. And many of us are still using those tools to connect as we as we as we learn and, and work together across uh, distance now. But of course, digital technology, although it can make us feel more connected, it can also make us feel more uh, isolated. And um, particularly um, when, when there's a barrier to, to accessing those resources. And that could be people uh, left behind by technology, such as my mum, people that are unable to afford technology, or the people, as we're talking about today, who are unable to access or use technology because, because of a disability. And what I'd really like to concentrate on today is, is understanding that when we support people at the edges, perhaps, it ends up benefiting everybody. It ends up benefiting every student and every staff member. I think my first, um, my first, when I was teaching back in Cambridge in, in, in the late 1990s, 1999, I think it was actually, and I actually had a blind student I was teaching. It was the first blind student that had ever been taking a chemistry degree in the UK that we, we were aware of. And you can imagine the challenges that, that were associated with that. There was a time when, when lecture notes were, were, were usually scribbles on, the, on a chalkboard that people would, would copy down. And so I had to really get my lecturers and myself um, across the, not just writing, making sure we had electronic versions of those materials, but actually making sure that they were accessible, which was a challenge back in 1999. But it was a very successful one and it was very rewarding when that student graduated with a first class uh, degree in, in chemistry in 2000 and, and 2002. And, and ever since then, we've been trying to get my lecturers to, to make sure that their resources are digitally accessible. And that's become easier and easier um, um, over the years. And one of the things I was really proud of is the way that when we did the Canvas transition, we really concentrated on, on, on making sure that accessibility was at the forefront. And Jason, one of the speakers today, was part of the uh, procurement process and was probably the first big procurement process when we put accessibility of the system at the forefront. It was actually a yes, no on which system we would go for. If the system didn't, um, if the system wasn't up to it, we simply wouldn't have gone with it. And then when we did the procurement, well, sorry, when we actually went, chose Canvas, we made sure that when we were transferring units, it was really an uplift in digital accessibility. And I think somewhat successful, if not um, completely so. And one of the things I think is the most important when we're 
considering that is making sure that our simple systems like Word and PowerPoint are used properly and so that people can make uh, resources that are accessible with minimal workload. So what we're going to learn about today is, is, is really a, some great examples of, of how we can, we can support staff and students um, and so that we end up with a campus that's pretty seamless and accessible for everybody, whether they're in the physical classroom, in the virtual classroom, um, in the office or, or at home. Um, and we want to reduce those achievement gaps. We want to make it easier um, for staff to use technologies so that it's part of their everyday work. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, the wonderful Anna, who's going to talk about uh, uh, the way that she's been using an avatar to, to help her. Anna. Thanks for that, Adam. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you all so that you can see my presentation. Maybe someone in the panel can just confirm that it's clear. Yes. Thumbs up. Good. Okay. Yeah, so my name's Anna Boucher. I'm an associate professor in the discipline of government and international relations, and I also live with several disabilities. Um, so people with disability actually often lead with techno technological change because they have to. Um, and then sometimes that change is picked up by other people. So that's an interesting um, aspect, I think, of disability is that far from being um, on the margins, often uh, people with disability actually bring these technological in innovations into the mainstream. So I, um, in my experience, have had a, I'm just closing those reminders so that I don't bother us. Um, I've had a voice disability, which has made it hard for me to speak. Um, and so today I'm gonna to talk about how, as a result, I developed an AI avatar some of the challenges with the development of the avatar, how I constructed it, and some of my early reflections on it. Um, so, as I mentioned, I have chronic throat pain, um, which means it's very hard for me to speak for more than about 40 minutes without pain. So it's okay today, because this is a short lecture, but it is a problem for me. Um, even before COVID, I experimented with videos, uh, making videos in Camtasia, um, like short videos so that it, it, the accumulative length of the videos was the full lecture length, but students made clear to me that they preferred synchronous learning. I then went to TED Talk in 2019, where I was inspired by the lived experience of Tom Nash, um, DJ Hooky. He had Melinda Cockle and lost um, his hands and his feet, so he needed to walk and um, use his hands um, as with hooks. And he managed to DJ with hooks. And I thought if he can DJ with hooks, I can find a way to speak um, without pain. So I started uh, doing research into Stephen Hawking, who of course famously used a, a voice assisted technology to speak. Um, he had um, IBM made him a new, uh, a, new uh, a new technology to speak every year and it was constantly updated. So Hawking is a good example because he was, uh, sorry, a spelling mistake there. He um, lived with a disability and was really revolutionary in um, the creation of voice assisted technology with the assistance of IBM. But since his um, work, there's been obviously the advent of AI and a fast acceleration. There are a lot of off the shelf products that are quite cheap, but they are also clunky. So Jason Marco, who's the lead, uh, uh, digital accessibility here at the University of Sydney and myself uh, with the help of ICT tried to develop our own um, but this is very complex um, so in the end I myself purchased an avatar through Sarah Proc which is a Scottish company and I think a world leader in the use of avatars they've done some amazing work um, in um, creating avatars for a variety of different needs and you can read about that in my article at teaching at Sydney so that's what we did in the end. Um, I'm gonna show you how now with a short video that uh, my husband talked of me, how I actually um, made the avatar. So basically what this required was reading uh, hundreds of lines from Guardian newspaper articles um, that recorded my voice. I had to do it in short spaces of time because it actually made my, I uh, was created pain, the construction of it. So it took me about a year. Um, and they were uploaded onto a cloud where Sarah Prop then constructed the avatar by comparing my voice against other voices. Um, I could then type uh, the 
uh, I can then type the lectures. What I do is I type the lectures in a full script and I upload them to a uh, app called Ghostreader. Ghostreader then reads the lecture as I toggle the PowerPoint. So that's essentially um, how the avatar works. Uh, here you can see me at home constructing the avatar. I'll just give you a short example. Like I do this for an hour and it creates Now we have finally heard her. Now we have finally heard her. I buy three apples. I buy three apples. Okay, so that's basically me constructing it um, last year and the year before. And then um, I used, started using it this year in guest lectures I was giving in the uh, discipline of government international relations. And so um, Alex Terming from Education Innovation has helped me cut this from the download um, from Canvas. Um, this is the very first time I use the avatar for teaching. You'll note a few things. There's a bit of mispronunciation by the avatar of my script. Um, also, you'll note a little bit of squeakiness. Um, so this, is, as I mentioned, is the first time. So let's have a listen. Thanks for having me here today. As noted by Henry Ma, I will be teaching this lecture through voice assisted technology as I have a disability that makes it painful for me to speak for long periods of time. That said, I can touch type. So if you want me to answer questions, we can do that by the Zoom chat if you have any questions. So lots of opportunities for feedback using this method. Furthermore, these are questions close to my heart, both because I received my doctorate from the LSE where some of these key theorists were placed, and questions of ontology remain central, and also because research ethics feature in my work on immigration and diversity. Also, I will be surveying you Okay, so that was the first time. I then um, made a full, I re-listened to the entire video and made notes for Sarah Prock of where there were errors in pronunciation and also uh, raised the issue of the squeaks. Sarah Prock is very sophisticated, but still this is the first time in the world that anyone has used their avatars for academic um, presentations. And so because of that, some of, I guess, some academic lingo is not known within their cloud-based system. So they needed to improve that. You'll, this is another lecture and you can hear that the squeaking has reduced and the pronunciation is better, although it's still not perfect. There is an argument that in diverse, multi-ethnic societies, they must also be diverse. Some have also argued that diversity, ideologically, politically, and in terms of gender and ethnic representation, can affect legal outcomes. The readings providing the following example from the 2000 US election. For example, the US Supreme Court decided the outcome of the 2000 presidential election by voting along party lines that George W. Bush had won the election in the state of Florida. Okay, the other interesting thing here is you'll note the avatar speaking a bit slower which is something students often complain about, that we speak too fast. Um, obviously, it's sometimes hard for us to modulate that as we speak. The kind of cool thing about the avatar is that you can toggle as you're speaking, um, as the avatar is speaking for you, and reduce or increase the speed within Ghost Reader. Um, some things the avatar doesn't have, obviously, it has a quite flat effect. Um, it doesn't understand tone or pitch or humour. Um, it's, uh, it has no theatrical performative element. These are limitations of the avatar. So I just want you to well, you can kind of get a sense of my normal lecturing voice from this presentation, but there it, is an argument here that you can died. see me answering a Q and A and how the avatar differs from me in my normal lecturing mode. Patrick's asked, would you say a constitution is only as important as interpretation is faithful? I mean, we haven't really looked and detail at different models of constitutional interpretation and judicial interpretation today. I think the general view, even among people more um, legally conservative, is that a constitution has to be malleable. So 
you can't read a constitution as though we're still sitting in 1901 right like it has to adapt to the reality of the modern times um so i, I kind of i guess a completely faithful um positivist kind of reading might not um, allow for that kind of malleability patrick's asked so you can see there obviously i have um a more interactive style than the avatar is capable of i also arm and arm although i have more imperfections than the avatar um and and i think actually the combination of using the avatar for the speech and then keeping my voice for a short space at the end for q a it was actually in that lecture quite a good combination so in terms of advantages and disadvantages, I mean, the first and most fundamental is the avatar allows me to speak without pain, um, which is great to finish a lecture and not have pain for several days afterwards. The avatar allows me to chat with students at the same time. And this goes back to the point at the beginning that Adam made that we might actually see innovation with um, this technology. I mean, it's very hard, even if we're skilled, to be able to speak a complex lecture and engage in a, in a separate conversation simultaneously. But because I only need to select the section of the avatar speech and then wait until it pivots to the next slide. I can actually do that with the avatar. I can um, have a simultaneous chat function going at the same time as the avatar is speaking. The avatar, I also think, reduces age, gender, and racial bias and stereotyping for lecturers. And um, there's a lot of academic research on this. So this is not some kind of conjecture that demonstrates that there that this does occur in um, academic lecturing and you can see that cited in my teaching at Sydney article so when I surveyed the students that actually thought I was older than I am when usually they think I'm younger than my, I am and they were also not sure what my gender was then I think this could potentially present advantages to people who are sometimes um, experienced stereotypes for being non-standard within their particular area of um, academic lecturing in terms of disadvantages it the avatar sometimes speaks too fast, but as I've said, we can toggle um, the ghost reader app to change according to student need, and I can do that mid lecture. The avatar sometimes mispronounces words such as diversity, uh, but Sarah Proc can fix these for me. The biggest problem with the avatar is it requires me to type a full lecture verbatim in advance. Any mistakes um, will be read out as mistakes by the avatar. A spelling mistake, a typo, everything has to be perfect. And this is very time consuming. And that is where major disability adjustments are required. The avatar takes away, I think, finally, the human element of performance and tone in speech. And you can see that from the comparative examples. Still, to me, it's clear that we need to take academics as they are, able bodied or not, as we do everyone in um, society. And so if we have disability challenges, this should be accommodated by students or at the very least accepted. Um, so I think this is a good solution. It's an imperfect solution, uh, but it's a good solution within the scope of uh, disability. Uh, finally, uh, these are some of my contact details. And if you're interested in more information about the avatar, uh, please look at my article, Why is my lecturer a robot now? Um, and if you're interested in working with me on the avatar, or I'm interested in, for instance, experimenting with how students might find it, you can email me and we can talk about that further. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. That was so uh, inspiring, but also it generated so many questions and thoughts in my head, um, which I'm going to save until we get to the end. But please use the Q&A to, to capture those, those questions. Um, Jason, I meant, as I mentioned earlier, Jason from ICT has been is, is instrumental in making sure that when we put in a new technology that it's it's accessible, it has the correct accessibility features, as well as being a leader in making sure that we we, we provide materials to staff to uh, to help them use the tech tools that we have. So I'm going to hand over straight away to you, Jason. Hi, um, just checking that everyone can see my slide, okay, and hear me, okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay, thanks, Adam, for the introduction. Thanks, Anna, for that. Um, excellent um, presentation on the voice avatar. So my presentation is going to be pretty brief today. Um, Anna's already given us a lot of context for the voice avatar, but I did want to use it as an example of how we can do um, assistive technology support at the university. I also just want to talk a bit about how you can get support if you or someone you know within the university, staff or student, might require some form of assistive technology adjustment. 
Um, so uh, we're the digital accessibility team in ICT. Um, I have Kathy Wiseman, who I think is um, coming along today. Uh, and we look after um, assistive technology uh, for staff and students with disabilities. We provide advice, training, and support. Um, the kind of technologies we support include screen reading software that's used by uh, people with blindness. We support magnification software that's used by people with low vision, uh, text-to-speech software like Kurzweil 3000 and Text Help Read and Write Gold, which um, helps people with different cognitive impairments like ADHD, dyslexia, and memory impairments. We also support um, Dragon Naturally Speaking, which is a uh, assistive software that's available to any staff member to uh, request through the services portal. Uh, it's something that um, uh, Emma uses for her work and um, something that I've tried to help her with over the years. Um, so this is used by people who have difficulty writing, but also people who might have a physical disability uh, find difficulty using a standard keyboard or mouse. So you can both dictate text with the program, but you can also control your computer by voice. You can move things around, click links and buttons and so on. As Adam mentioned, we also try to make um, learning materials accessible to staff and students. So this means taking hard copy and format shifting it to accessible electronic documents. Uh, we produce some Braille uh, for students with blindness. We repair PDF and PowerPoint for accessibility. Um, and we also look after all the, the captioning and transcription needs of our students with hearing impairment. Um, we also do accessibility testing. Um, so this is reviewing websites, apps, and documents for compliance with accessibility guidelines and providing advice about how um, university staff can make their content more accessible. And last year, as part of the Disability Inclusion Action Plan, we formed a panel of um, students with different accessibility needs who we employ as user experience testers, and they provide their expertise uh, in using their technology and lived experience of disability. So we include their feedback in our reports. Um, assistive technology is available as a workplace adjustment for staff and students um, can use it as an educational adjustment. Um, students are usually connected with us through inclusion and disability services who will refer students uh, they register who might have a need for assistive technology. Staff can contact us directly through email or phone. Um, and we often get referrals to staff from colleagues um, who are trying to help out and the um, staff uh, health support officers are also a good point of contact for us. Sometimes we have an opportunity to work on something a bit more cutting edge like the avatar that um, Anna has been discussing. So if you have an idea about you know similar technology or another technology which um, could be a benefit to you or your colleagues or your students with disabilities, um, we're really keen to get involved and help out in any way we can. Um, so this slide, I just want to go through some um, common considerations and myths around um, uh, assistive technology and then just briefly what our involvement was with the avatar. Um, so when you're adopting a new technology, there's often a steep initial learning curve and it takes time to people, for people to adjust to different ways of working. And as Anna discussed, um, it can also create a lot of additional workload, um, such as the amount of text she has to type out in order to generate um, the lectures that are voiced with the avatar. Um, so this may require additional support from the university for the technology to be effective and usable. Um, assistive technology also, as Adam mentioned uh, when, this, um, when this started today, also depends on the accessibility of our digital environment. So we need to ensure that our technology platforms and the content we create um, and develop and procure for the university is accessible. If it's not, people are likely to experience barriers, which reduces the effectiveness of the assistive technology. Um, some myths around assistive technology. So assistive technology is essential and important, but it's not a magic solution. And um, it really is just part of, part of one part of the mix that, of adjustments that people with disabilities are going to need to participate in the life of our university. Um, aside from the technology, the biggest obstacle that um, students and staff with disabilities report to me is attitudinal. Um, and one example of that might be when we assume that because someone's been provided with say a screen reader um, or other technology to help them study at the university that the problem is solved, um, but this is often not the case. Um, we can change this by becoming disability confident and consulting with and listening to people with disability about their needs and preferences and avoiding making assumptions for them um, about what might work best. 
Um, another point, that, which is often, uh, I guess, a misperception about assistive technology is that it always has to be expensive specialist software. Assistive technology is literally everywhere now. So it's built into your phones, it's available in your computers. Um, Microsoft has the excellent ease of access settings and um, Apple also has the built-in accessibility features, which are highly useful. There's assistive technology built into browsers. Um, there's, it's available as browser extensions, which can you know, have similar impacts and, and assistance as some of the more uh, specialist and mainstream assistive technologies. Um, so one thing that we do is we maintain a, a series of pages on Canvas that list different apps for accessibility. And these are beneficial for people with permanent disabilities, but also useful for anyone with a temporary or situational impairment. Um, just very quickly, because I, I know I'm uh, running out of time. Um, so with the support for Anna, it was really just to play a supporting role. Um, uh, we looked at a lot of different um, options. There's many, as, as Anna mentioned, as many off the shelf solutions, but when I tested them, they just, the voice wasn't particularly natural. Um, so uh, eventually we stumbled upon uh, Sarah Proc and the communication was really good. The voices sounded really good. Um, so that was a goer for us. We did try the Tech Lab solution, which was using open source um, AI software, but uh, there was just would have been too much um, uh, recording of Anna's speech to make it viable. And there wasn't an easy pathway to uh, taking the experiment and making it a standalone uh, text to speech voice. Um, so the two main requirements was that the voice had to be usable as a system voice for Anna. So as Anna uses a Mac, it has to be a standalone system voice that can be installed in the accessibility settings. Um, another important consideration was privacy and the security of Anna's uh, data. Um, so, you know, it does bring up a lot of these issues because she is essentially providing her biometric data to the company. And um, some of the companies we looked at didn't really have a clear policy around this or it was a bit vague. So that was a red flag for us. So, yeah, it was fantastic when um, Anna uh, signed up with Sarah Proc and went through the process of creating the voice, after which we just needed to figure out how it would be um, used in her um, teaching and yeah we did a few demos to ensure that um, it was usable and work out some of the bugs um, so that's all I have to say today thank you for listening and um, yeah look forward to answering any questions you might have thanks Adam thanks so much Jason and as, as Jason said at the end there please just pop any questions you've got in the Q&A we've got about 10 minutes at the end we hope to uh, to go through those so please put them in the Q&A Q &A rather than the chat um, our next speaker is Emma Carberry. So I had the great pleasure of lecturing after Emma quite commonly in the, in the chemistry lecture theatres, which would have been a very difficult place to lecture. Um, it was difficult, uh, difficult enough to, to use those lecture theatres for me. Um, and I know I was always inspired by the number of questions that Emma had from her students after her lectures. And so I'd, I'm really looking forward to hearing about how Emma's and now also making use of physical, as not only physical assistive technology, but also digital Emma. Thank you, Adam. And that's a very polite way of saying that I was quite terrible at getting out of the lecture theatre on time when you needed to come in. So um, thank you for the understanding. Uh, so I have been using assistive technology since about 2001 when I uh, developed a disability. So I have physical use of my hands, but it is painful to use them for very long. Um, writing, handwriting is a problem pretty much before I get to the end of the sentence of the first sentence and typing and using the mouse is something that I can do for a couple of minutes. But if I want my pain levels to be low, then I should do those as little as possible. So I've been using Dragon, naturally speaking, since that time. It has improved quite considerably in the last 21 years, as you would imagine. It's, it's the... Um, technology that is behind, as Jason said, what we use for voice recognition in our phones. And so it's probably actually quite familiar with people these days, but it does um, also have the ability to navigate you around a page. So if I want the mouse to click on a particular part of my screen, then I can do that with Dragon commands. Although it must be said that it's very good if you just want to write a block of text and it uses its technology to, um, it knows what words tend to come together in a sentence. So if you're simply trying to say one word at a time, 
then it's recognition of that would be okay. But if you're speaking in normal sentences, then it's recognition is very good. In terms of the other types of tasks, so navigating your way around your computer or opening various programs and doing functions in them, it is good with some things. It's particularly good when people have created their programs or their documents to be accessible. But there are other things where it's um, quite a frustrating experience. And so it can take a lot more time to do things with voice. But on the other hand, if you're simply writing text, if you simply need to write an email or create a Word document, then I would say it can actually be quicker than typing. Um, and one thing that I think is worth noting is I have seen various colleagues over the years, for instance, start to get repetitive strain injury or perhaps break a hand or something which is temporary. And I've noticed really considerable reluctance. They see that I use this technology. They know I don't use my hands, but they think it's really quite complicated. And so I've seen like, you're going to be like this for six weeks. There is voice recognition that you can use. I really want to plug that the probably the biggest change that's happened in the last 21 years, the, the company that makes this, it's clear that their main focus is not people like myself who, who need to use their technology and improving the kind of accessibility to more aspects of being able to use your computer. The, the areas that they're looking for are the idea that we will probably all be using voice technology at some point and trying to make their product um, easy to pick up and accessible to a large number of people. So if you have some problem, even for a short period of time, the university has a site license. We have um, amazing support in, in Jason, and I would encourage you to, to give that a try. Um, I think it's really important to note though, that the technology, although it's helpful, certainly doesn't do everything. So I find in my lecturing, for example, when I first started um, lecturing at the university, so I was making slides using voice recognition technology, and that was all I could do. So that if students had questions, I was very lucky in the first couple of semesters, I had some great students who I could pull to the board if somebody else had a question and write for me, but you can't rely on that. I mean, that's um, that, that requires certain personalities amongst your student body to make something like that work. And so the university um, has provided funding to, to pay for somebody in my lectures to, to scribe so that if I want to do, I'm a mathematician, if I want to prove things, if I want to do examples, if I want to answer student questions, that person can, can do the handwriting for me. And that support has made the world of difference to my students um, and you know, to the level of satisfaction I get out of my teaching too. I think that um, the importance of visible role models is really huge. In I've had quite a lot of feedback from students over the years, completely unsolicited, that they um, that they see me as a role model in showing that things can be done in in different ways, and it, it's great to be spreading the word in that way. And I think that there have also been times when lived experience mean that I'm able to um, have a greater understanding of what needs of a student might be. So for example, a few years ago, we had um, a student in a first year class who uh, was really unable to use her hands um, almost at all. And the university provided standard support. It was what they understood that she needs. So somebody to take notes, doesn't always happen, but still that was, that was the idea. And certainly support for somebody to write for her in an exam. But if you don't already know mathematics, you probably don't know that in order to learn the subject, you need to be able to do computations and you can't do computations in your head. You need someone to write for you in order to write down what you're saying and you think through the problems and learn for yourself. So she needed support, not just to produce, to, to demonstrate her knowledge, 
but to acquire the knowledge in the first place. And um, most first year students wouldn't understand actually that how the learning process works for a subject that they're not already expert in. But working with her, I could ask questions and see, oh, would this be helpful? And I think it it made a big difference. It it um it was the difference between uh, failing the subject first time around and not failing it the second time around and going on to successfully complete her degree. Um, so I think that um, having disabled people visible and building a community is, is hugely important. I have also seen attitudes change quite a lot during the time. When I first started, I very much encountered the idea that it was not appropriate to be lecturing mathematics using slides. Certainly the fact that I've had scribe support since then has really helped with that. Um, but also attitudes have changed. Lots of my colleagues now use slides. And another thing I would say is I'm contacted quite a lot by people around the world who through some colleague, they know that I use voice recognition. How on earth do you do this when you're trying to write technical mathematics? It's not, this, this doesn't come in sentences, use a programming language essentially to type things up. And that knowledge is something that we can share. I would say that there are a lot of challenges in using voice recognition for such a thing, but with support and with an open mind, both from me and the people around me, it's most things are possible. So um, we just encourage in general, the, the things that, that other speakers have, have spoken to of listening to people with disability and um, being open to what, what we can do. So thank you. I'm aware of time. I'll leave it there. Oh, thanks so much, Emma. That was that was absolutely fantastic. And I, I really liked lots of I'm making lots of notes as you're going on, but really that idea that the students are, are learning mathematics, learning how to think like mathematicians um, and, and the barriers have been removed. And it's actually helped that student make that jump from sort of uh, thinking that mathematics is all about learning proofs to actually being able to, to prove things themselves. That's, that's fine. Chemistry is very similar. So thanks so much. And please just feel free to ask questions in, in the Q&A. Um, I've certainly got a lot written down, so I can fill up 10 minutes with my own questions. I'm gonna, we're gonna finish today with, with Alex. Um, Alex works for, in the education innovation team and she's both been supporting Emma, but also I think we'll be talking about more general applications of technology, Alex. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, so the Disability at Work Network or DAWN at the University of Sydney recently prepared a submission to the university strategic plan, which is looking forward to 2032. Um, and they shared that with the wider university community. And I had a look at the network member contributions and was struck by one quote in particular that I wanna share that I think is really relevant to something we've all been talking about today. And that was quote, that people with disability are often at the forefront of technological innovation. This took me back to 2020 when we in the educational innovation team were tasked with um, pretty rapidly spinning up online teaching and online exams and ran some surveys on the process. Um, and in those surveys, we actually had a number of comments from students who self-identified as having disability, noting that for exams in particular, they had a markedly better experience doing their exams from home on their own computers in a technological environment that they had set up specifically to support their needs. Um, increasingly, we're also finding that things that are traditionally thought of as uh, thought of by many as academic plan adjustments um, actually also have much wider applications. Um, one that strikes me is captions. Captions on lecture videos or transcripts, for example, support students with hearing loss, but they can also support students like a parent studying for home, from home at night who might need to keep an ear out for their kids. Um, students for whom English is an additional language who might just be more confident in reading rather than listening to speech. Um, and of course, people who just prefer having the option. I watch, I watch everything with captions on ever since I started doing it. And I find that gives me personally a richer experience because I quite like focusing on the text of um, TV shows. Um, now Anna and Emma highlighted a number of things that I'd like to just touch on really briefly. Um, I want to note here that these points are not necessarily linked to personalized avatars in the same way Anna's is, though I think those are really desirable. Um, I do want to say before moving on that voice avatars in the educational research literature have, um, have been identified as being perceived and uh, taken by students no differently to live voices. And so that is for student learning. There's work that shows that the student experience um, is 
no different when students are learning from Anna directly or from Anna's avatar, which I think is a great thing to support this more widely. Um, so the first thing I want to mention here is that Anna has sort of essentially duplicated herself as a lecturer in using this avatar, both delivering content with it, but also having discussions as she showed us using Zoom chat. Um, this creates a really rich way to work and engage with students and allows Anna as the uh, lecturer to sort of gauge where the students are going with the content, what things they're picking up, what things they're not, where things might need more explanation in the next lecture. Um, and this active engagement is something that we are really um, seeing a lot more. It can come in many different forms. This is just one, um, but it's something that we also see a huge amount of support for in educational literature in terms of enhancing and really enriching student learning. Um, secondly, of course, there's huge benefit with uh, for anyone, staff or student who lives with disability that affects their voice or their ability to communicate verbally. Um, thinking more about verbal communications, avatars can also offer more opportunities for our newer English speakers and those who might be less confident with their spoken English to contribute verbally. Um, we can also add to this students who are learning a language, a second, third or fourth language. Um, there have been suggestions that students might actually be more comfortable engaging in language learning conversations when they're using an avatar rather than their own voice. Um, voice avatars can also be seen as uh, to fall into education gamification, something that, uh, while it, it can be a little bit controversial, has shown benefits in certain situations and for certain learners. Um, that's in a non-disability context for those learners, of course. Um, educational literature, as Anna mentioned before, has also suggested that voice avatars can get around perceptive bias um, around things like age, background and perceived gender. Um, I don't necessarily think we should all be adopting um, male avatars with European accents, but um, it's something that we can use to sort of further investigate um, something that for some educators is a real challenge for them uh, in their profession. There's also a really large body of work on how both visual and voice avatars together are being successfully deployed in teaching and learning contexts. Um, I won't go into those now, but the quick live research should do the trick if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, and briefly before I end, I'd like to suggest that anyone who's interested in employing similar tech in their teaching, uh, reach out to those of us who've spoken today, particularly, of course, Jason, giving his huge expertise and role in this area, um, but also suggest that you consider us in educational innovation as your supporters um, in any endeavour that you, you might be thinking about. I'll pop our contact details in the chat in just a sec. Um, and as I said at the beginning, it's, it's very much, very likely that you are or will be the expert in your tech more so than us, um, but we'll be really excited to learn alongside you and to support both you and your students in engaging with the teaching and learning innovations that will continue to come from the accessibility space. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, and I think um, we've got some questions arriving in the chat, in the, in the Q&A, so please, please add to them after those really excellent talks and ideas and thoughts for the future. Um, I think the first question came actually from Colin, because I know it was from Colin because uh, he put it in the chat originally. Um, welcome, Colin. It's great to see you here. Uh, let's tweet about this. Um, so from Colin, for Anna, do you use your type lecture notes to create transcripts and captions? Sorry. Um, I haven't to date, but I could. I mean, what happened with the first lecture is that it created a transcript which was, which was imperfect. Um, as we've discussed, this transcript, these auto transcripts are often not perfect. So I guess I could do that um, in the future if that was a requirement, if students felt that it helped them. Um, but to date, I have not done that. No. I wonder if the question was about it was saving you work. Would that be a way of using, reusing the work you've already done? If I gave the lecture a second time. I mean, yeah. the, the issue is always with is teaching in social and political sciences that the material needs to be constantly updated. Um, so uh, like even that example I gave about um, constitutions, I mean, we might think that differently post the leaking of the overturn of Roe v Wade in recent weeks. So no, I think I'd have to edit it substantially every year. Um, unfortunately, given the nature of the subject matter I teach, I think if you're teaching ancient history or something, maybe that would be less the case. But um, yeah, I teach in an area where we really have to keep on top of the news and the scholarship on a month to month basis. And the election coming up on Saturday, that sort of thing. Exactly. 
Uh, maybe the second one for Jason can take. Um, uh, so Anna talked a little bit about some of the advantages and disadvantages of the voice avatar and its ability to modulate pitch and tone, et cetera. Um, Jason, do you know if they're improving this? Um, to be honest, I think the focus has mainly been on the articulation so far and um, expressiveness is still something that the voices aren't tackling that well. Some of the more advanced um, AI voices using technologies like WaveNet are really, really impressive, but that technology isn't at the consumer level yet. So I think it will filter down to the sort of product that um, Anna is using or possibly those more advanced AI technologies will become uh, more read readily available to people um, so they can kind of uh, create their own avatar, um, which should should be more natural sounding than what's currently available over time. Thanks, Jason. Just, just sort of on the avatar, who, how is it funded? Do we buy avatars? How does that work? Um, I think, Anna, actually, there were some difficulties, to be honest, with um, navigating the purchasing of the avatar for Anna. And in the end, I think Anna, if it's okay to say this, I hope, um, ended up purchasing it herself, which I don't think is an ideal from a university perspective. Um, so yeah, there's definitely more the university can be doing. Um, with the way it works currently is that adjustments are sort of split between faculties and the disability support fund. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely the process isn't as um, seamless and smooth as it could be. Um, and staff shouldn't be required to purchase their own tech for um, using assistive technologies at the university. And, and the second part of Sylvia's question was around um, when an avatar is purchased, and there's presumably there's updates to the to the tech to those flow to that that user do they get the benefits of the new update? yeah i think um anna's had quite a lot of back and forth with um sarah proc when as she mentioned during a talk when there are issues with the pronunciation of particular words and they can fix that pretty quickly actually so it's usually um when anna raises an issue it's within the next day or so that they're able to provide a new model for the voice that she can download and use so yeah they're very responsive um and i'm sure that with the license that she's using she will continue to receive the benefits of any technology adaptations and innovations that they introduce to their product if i can just add to that i mean sarah prox explained to me because they're um working off a cloud base the more people they have building this av their avatars the more they can compare my voice against other voices, it works on the basis of other cloud technology. And so over time, the avatar will be improved. The disadvantage is that Jason and I need to, it's quite tedious, deleting the old avatar off my computer and reinstalling. And that's why also it's good that I can do this online. If I had to deal with every single uh, lecture theatre at Sydney University, I think it, we would get nowhere. Um, that is probably the disadvantage also, also that I have to then listen to the video and um, record to the second every um, incorrect pronunciation and send that to Sarah Proc. But the advantage of paying a reasonable amount of money for this advertise that we get a good support service from Sarah Proc. That's great. And let's make sure we, you, you don't have to pay in the future. I think that should be a priority for us. Emma, maybe we can, maybe I can ask a question that will spring to, to my mind when you were talking about a student sort of, uh, a student in the audience helping writing down the solutions that you were discussing. How does that work? You, is that a PhD student, somebody that's in your group that's able to, to know the mathematics so well that they can they can follow your, your direction? So in terms of, I've had, um, I've worked with various students um, over the years. It's very often been someone who's working with me. Uh, I think it's a reasonably attractive job for those people, but it has also been an undergraduate who has taken um, that class previously. If it's a first year subject, then the level of technical expertise that they need is not so high. And it's things like, you know, neat handwriting, the ability to actually write things correctly as opposed to, to to the way that a professional mathematician would write something out as opposed to the way that a beginner would write things out and some students are more on top of that than others so it's an interview process and um yeah it's it's varied as to how well that has worked because 
I also cannot put all my effort into explaining to the student what to write. I need to be explaining to the students what's needed at the time. Um, but it generally works well and I've learned enormous things from it. So I, at first I, I was, um, it's adjusted my teaching style in the sense that when students used to come to my office hours before I had trouble writing, I would be at the board and they would ask me questions and I would write and explain the answers. Now they are at the board and people will nod and say yes and write down and not understand a thing, but they will not write on the board when they don't understand. And so it makes the process, in, in that situation, it makes the process slower and 10 times as effective. Yeah, and deeper. I know I can, I think yeah. all the teachers in the room are nodding their heads. <laughs> and about exactly that. Writing down is not the same as, um, as being able to, to, no. to demonstrate it. That's but you get to see what a student does and doesn't understand. And actually, it happens, especially in my advanced class, that the person who's scribing misunderstands something. And it's a teaching moment. It's not at all that went wrong. It's, okay, you made this mistake that half the class will have that same misunderstanding. And now I have the opportunity to, to pounce, not to, you know, at them, but to, to explain that better and say, yes, this is common misunderstanding, but it actually works like this. It, it actually works really well, I think. I, I completely agree. I mean, giving the students opportunities to fail, or giving us opportunities to fail, that's yeah. where the learning moments happen. I'm just going to finish with a question for, for Alex that, that sprung to my mind. Something that Anna was talking about was that reducing bias thing. And we've, we've and, and, and the reasons why those biases are there are, are not great, but they are there, part of unconscious bias um, or conscious bias, even sometimes, Alex. Um, we also have a sort of philosophy that being human and building relationships is key to, to teaching effectiveness. So how do you, how do you marry those two things? Oh, that's a really good question. I think, look, the, the, the challenge with this perceptive bias is that obviously it's, it's present and it's affecting us and our students in, in real time. Um, and so I think for, for a lot of people, the idea of using an avatar um, would immediately improve both our experience and our students' experience. I'm sure we've all heard of those papers that um, have, a, you know, a young woman and then an older man um, of, of varying backgrounds deliver content, exactly the same content in exactly the same way. And you see survey results be quite different for them. And it does differ, interestingly, depending on um, faculty as well, or sort of area of expertise. Um, they're really interesting. I'd suggest looking into them if you're interested. Um, but then again, of course, one of the things I would like to think that we at, at Educational Innovation are thinking about is how we can break down those perceptive biases and change change them with students. Um, personally, I found success with talking to students about these types of things, telling them, sharing this research with them, sharing this literature with them, telling them that you know they need to think about this in a wider context, not just for me as their teacher, but for other people that they're working with as their teachers and thinking deeply about that. Um, I'm obviously in an arts background and, and I, I, when I teach, I work in an area where talking about these things is, is absolutely part of our curriculum. Um, but to me, that's led to some really, really rich discussions about students with, with students about um, representation, about where people go in terms of their strengths versus in terms of where expectations can be. So I'd like to think that we can continue those conversations in order to, to keep breaking down those, those biases. Um, but acknowledging that this, the work that's being done in this space can be used to help direct us and direct our efforts um, at the moment. And, you know, for a lot of people um, potentially have a huge impact um, in the moment of teaching and learning. Thanks so much, Alex. And, and I think, Emma, as, as, as Emma said, that role modelling is, 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 is absolutely key here. So uh, thanks, to, thanks to Anna, Alex, Jason and Emma, some inspiring words. Um, where do we go from here as a university? Well, we want to be a we want to be a world leader um, in this, and I think we have an opportunity in our current strategic plan conversations about making sure that we are. And I think I invite everybody to to use the fora that are available on the internet to, to, to comment and really to push that agenda. I think it's really important. We we do have um, we do have this achievement gap at the university, and we do want to decrease that. And I think making those making it as easy as possible for staff, I think, is absolutely key here the workload implications of some of this are uh, um, we need to minimize as, as Jason said and use the technologies in the way that they're intended 
Um, so we do need to make it just part of everyday life. And as, as, as Emma also said, in, in 20 years time, the probably close to five years time, the technologies will be so good that people will be just doing a lot of this. Um, we, we, you know, people will be doing this whether they break their hand or, or it will just be faster and easier for, for everybody. So use the technologies that we've got as well as the more innovative things that, that, that are available. Um, um, it's really important, I think, to seek out training for, for all of us. And I think that Jason's rolling out some additional training in, in June. And as I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, stuff available on the internet that's really high quality and really, really very pragmatic and help people to, to learn very quickly. And I think it's, it's, this is a social justice moment for us. I think it's about enhancing student success and making sure all our teachers are, are able to teach um, in, the way that, in the way that Emma and Anna were really describing how we can get very high quality education for, stu for students at the edges and everybody in between will, will, will rise as a, as a consequence. Um, so when we're thinking about our course design, we really need to make sure that our courses are inclusive and we remove those, those barriers. And I think those barriers are being removed and I think the technology will, we have a lot of technologies Jason spoke about already and, and new innovations coming on all the time to make sure this just becomes part of everyday life. Once it's part of everyday life, um, we, will, we will get there. But it's marrying those sort of UDL principles, making sure that that doesn't, isn't incompatible with sort of digital accessibility guidelines and principles that we put out to make sure that we don't, we don't stop doing things. Um, we just do more things for students along the way. And that we don't really put up with things on the staff side that we would not put up with for, for students wouldn't put up with and would tell us what's not right. So making sure that the staff are supported as well as, as, as well as students. It's been a fantastic morning. I hope you've got a lot from it. I certainly have. Um, as we mentioned in the chat, we will make sure that the video and the transcripts are available. So um, I just wanted to thank you all for a, such as Colin just said, a fantastic session and thank our speakers, uh, Anna, Emma, Alex and Jason for their inspiring words this morning. Have a great day and I'll see you all soon.